Good evening. Welcome, everyone, to Beyond the Gatekeepers. I am Bishop-elect Vanessa M. Brown. I'm excited to be here with you on tonight. So excited about our conversation. And tonight we're going to be talking about the politics of morality in America, uh, white evangelical racism. And the author is Dr. Anthea Butler. And before I bring her, I want to acknowledge our audience on tonight, Facebook Live, Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Make sure you shout yourself out. Tell us where you're from. YouTube, thank you for being here. We're so glad. Instagram, thank you for being here. Twitter, thank you for being here. Shout yourselves out. Tell us where you are hailing from. And so we're so glad to have you. I see people already are talking and telling us good evening, saying they're from Ohio and Louisiana. This is good. Uh, make sure that you share this Facebook Live. This is going to be a very a very, very good discussion on tonight. And I don't want to delay the time. I do want to bring our guest on. And so let me introduce the woman of the hour on tonight. Her name is Dr. Anthea Butler. She is the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor in American Social Thought, Chair of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And she is the author of this book that we're going to talk about tonight, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Dr. Anthea, please uh, introduce yourself to all of our uh, social media platforms and tell them uh, what you're working on right now. Well, I'm working on being here, first of all, Bishop Black Brown. So thank you so much for having me. And shout out to everybody on Twitter, first of all, where I'm always at, at Anthea Butler. Um, shout out to the folks on Instagram. Shout out to the folks on Facebook. And shout out to the folks on YouTube. Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you that you are here to hear about my book, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. 
Um, you know, I'm just trying to work on being a black woman who who loves Jesus and is trying to survive in this COVID pandemic world where at white evangelicals are trying to kill us all. Listen, that says it in a nutshell, okay? Yep. I, I don't think I can put it any other kind of way. I hate to say it like that. But I mean, you know, it's basically we are we are under siege right now, and we are under siege by people who believe that they are following Christ, but they are following the Republican Party. And I think that it's really important for us to begin to understand those of us who are out here trying to do the right thing and you know and be kindful and mindful of our neighbors right now that there are people in this country who don't think that they should do that and they think that's about their faith. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna bring the rest of our uh, platform on tonight. I'm grateful uh, they are here with us every week um, and it is none other than Bishop Carlton D. Pearson. He is an author, progressive spiritual teacher and thought leader. Bishop Pearson, come and greet our people tonight. Good evening, everybody. It's always good to be here and to entertain your consciousness for however long you stay with us. And we're especially happy to have Dr. Butler with us tonight and her book and her mind and the things she's going to bring out. I have been involved in evangelicalism literally all my life and have never felt more disillusionment, disappointment, and disenchantment with the institution as a whole. Uh, working with integration of cultures and races for the last 50 years here in Oklahoma with my Azusa Conference, our multiracial church. And now all of a sudden, most of the non-Black members and followers and partners that I've had over the years voted for Trump and are into the whole QAnon and this worship of this man and this mentality that I find repulsive and disgusting. And I think this is the saddest moment in my religious experience, more upsetting to me than the rejection I got from preaching the gospel of inclusion. I understood that to a certain uh, extent. I do not understand the mentality, nor do I support this, this the mentality of uh, mostly white evangelical Christians who think King James and King Jesus are the same people. We'll talk about that later, but you've heard me say it before. They got it really twisted. So we need to talk about untwisting it, if that's even possible in this special time in human American and, and church history. It's going to be a great evening. Thank you so much, Bishop Pearson. Always great to have your voice with us on tonight. Uh, I want to, first of all, keep shouting before I say to uh, bring on Bishop Flunder. Uh, San Francisco is in the house. Chicago is in the house. Reno, Nevada is in the house. St. Louis is in the house. U.S. Virgin Islands are here with us on tonight. Ohio is here with us on tonight. We are grateful for all of your presence so far. Uh, we have our great Bishop here. She's the presiding prelate of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, and she is the senior pastor of City of Refuge in Oakland, California. Please greet our audience tonight, Bishop Plunder. Greetings, everyone. I have to tell you that this is uh, a conversation that I have been anticipating for quite some time. And I will say that primarily the reason I have anticipated it is because we have not only a Bishop Pearson who has hands-on experience with white evangelicalism, up close, well, not only the, the folks that are alive and well now, but their parents, and in some cases, their grandparents. It's an amazing thing uh, for him to have been in some ways uh, lifted up as the African-American poster person uh, in that environment and how that environment has exiled him in, in, in unbelievable ways when he began to embrace in, in a real public way much of what that environment no longer embraces. It, it amazes me how someone could have been as involved and as lifted up and overnight simply because of reaching out and seeking to make a part of the family of God those that that environment rejected made him also rejected. What an incredible sacrifice for justice. And I will say that to have him and Professor Anthea Butler, who uh, acknowledged the role of women, the role of women in the Church of God in Christ and their influence. And my experience with Mother Bailey and my experience with Mother McLaughlin and my experience with Dr. Mallory, 
so many things came back to my mind. And I remember very, 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 very well my conversation with my then uh, living uncle, uh, Bishop Hamilton, who was the general secretary of the general board of the Church of God in Christ. I said to him, why is it that the boards and the councils reject Mother River's request for the women to have equal votes, those women who were given the responsibility as missionaries and evangelists and district missionaries and state mothers. Why can't they vote in the General Assembly? My uncle who has passed away now, so Bishop Pearson, I don't have to be afraid that I'm messing up his, his future. He said to me, he said, because they are scared to death. If the women ever vote, it will change the church completely. He said that to me as a person who was a member of the general board. She wrote about it so powerfully. And now she, and they all use the Bible for the reason that all kinds of scriptures just tow up the Bible, looking for ways to make those things justifiable. And now we are in the company of a person who not only has experience with white evangelicalism, but we have a person who has written a incredible book to talk about how far away from the, the teachings and the way of Jesus and the intention of Jesus, this particular brand of white evangelicalism has moved and is seeking to move the church and is seeking to move the nation. She has done an incredible job. If you don't get it, I want to tell you now, run out and get the book. All right. You need to, you need to read this in a day so that you can start changing everything around you tomorrow morning. We are so glad that she is here with us and I am excited about listening to them talk. So I've said mine on the front end, Bishop Black Vanessa. I want to hear the conversation between both sides of the fence tonight from an experienced person and experienced researcher around this issue. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to say what I had to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bishop Flunder. And we are ready to get to this conversation. All of our social media friends, all the platforms, thank you. Do me a favor and share because there are people that need to hear this conversation on tonight. Dr. Butler, in your book, you argue that evangelicalism is not only about cultural whiteness, but it is also about political whiteness. White evangelicals support candidates who espouse both political and moral views that coalesce with theirs. I need you all, both you and Dr. Pearson, as Bishop Funder said, let's flow with this conversation. I want you to say more about the premise of your book. Yeah, I, I think my book could be summed up in one sentence that I say in there that racism is a feature and not a bug of American evangelicalism. And racism is at the core of all of this. I believe that one of the things that really stuck out to me, both in my time and being an evangelical and also teaching this, is that what white evangelicals have done is to use morality as a way to make that a shield to hide their power grab, the kinds of power that they want to get and they've been having with the Republican Party. And what I do in the book is show this from slavery to freedom, to the civil rights movement, to the 1970s and 80s when we had the rise of the religious right, all the way through George Bush, through President Barack Obama, and then to the, uh, the apotheosis of everything, Donald J. Trump, who has become a sort of demigod to white American evangelicals. And I think of what people need to take away from this conversation tonight is the fact that they have been using scripture and morality that they don't care to follow themselves as a way to control people and to get you to do what they want you to do, first of all, and then secondarily to raise money, to support kinds of um, Republican candidates that don't have any morality whatsoever, but are using that morality to keep black, brown, yellow people and everybody else in bondage to white supremacy. Bishop Pearson, I mean, I know that you can talk a, a lot about what she's saying because you have experienced it. You were steeped in this. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Butler says, uh, Dr., uh, Bishop Pearson, is that there are a lot of reasons one might attribute for more people calling themselves evangelical. 
but it certainly is not because of a great religious revival. There's no great religious revival coming. Evangelicals are engaged in a political revival steeped, as Dr. Butler already said, in racism, anti-immigrant sentiment, sexual morality, and misplaced nostalgia. Bishop Pearson, as an experienced person who has been a fundamentalist and been a part of this movement for many, many years, can you talk about that? Happy to. This goes back to 16th century King's English translation of the, the Vulg Latin Vulgate or the, the uh, Septuagint, the scriptures. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In English, the word creature doesn't mean human. It's a, a monster or an animal, a rodent, a rat. Um, slavery, get them slaved and make them slave, get, get them saved, get them slaves and make them saved or uh, enslave them and save them. They think they rescued us from heathen worship and worship of devils and our black skin or the dark continent. This whole mentality is in the psyche of white Europeans, Anglo-Saxons in particular, who also named Eve, they translated the word Hava in Hebrew to Eve meaning evil or evening or dark or shadowy. We've mistreated females. We've mistreated non-white entities on this planet in America more, more uh, violently than any other country and any other continent other than Islam and the way they treat women. But they're not against the colors of our skin. Americans are against people of color. And, and that goes back to the one book, the King James Version, that has influenced the consciousness of the Western world more than any other book in the last 400 years. So they think that enslaving us is saving us, the colonialism of scripture. They think they have a scriptural base to be Christian nationalists, to protect the white man's in God when it's really in guns that they trust. And they have more guns, I think, maybe than Bibles these days. Uh, and they, they shine the guns and preserve the guns more than they read the scriptures, except when they want to quote something to support their twisted theology. I think we should be very vocal. I'm wearing a, a t-shirt that says silence is violence. We are speaking out against the violations of the human species by this crop of people and the crap they preach and some of the crap they believe in. I know that sounds harsh and I mean it to sound harsh tonight. We cannot take this lightly. We cannot be silent. We need to reinterpret decolonialized scripture and our interpretation of it and of the culture. Black people or people of color are not creatures. And uh, we're not all preachers. We are human beings, just as equal as any other human being on the planet. And so we, we need to, to, to confront and even combat this evil mentality. Actually, I'll say this and then stop. <clears throat> They're losing ground and they know it. They're having a public display of a breakdown. Just like Trump anticipated Biden winning and these people that went to Washington on January 6th anticipating our overcoming them numerically, they're freaky. They cannot stand to be minorities and that's what they're becoming and uh, that's what they literally are in consciousness. And so everything is gonna be different. It looks rough right now, but let's ride it out because there's gonna be a leveling of the playing field in ways that they do not embrace and psychically they just can't. Without a new revival of their spirit, they're a lost, lost cause. Thank you, Bishop Pearson. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. The black church has bought into Master. this theology of white evangelicalism, lock, stock and barrel. From their music that we sing, to the theology that is espoused through preaching. Dr. Butler. You really gonna have me hurting people tonight, but let's go. I, I believe one of the things that has happened in the black church is this wholesale embrace, especially when we get to the mega church movement of the music and the style and everything else of white churches. So let me let me give you an example. I, I'm I'm not gonna name this big Kojic church, but I'm thinking about it. When they moved off of using the regular gospel music to these Maranatha songs, these soft songs, and then we get to the hill song mess right now. That's one way in which this whiteness, this cultural whiteness, has been bought into these churches. So. 
one of the things I think is important about my book is that when I take this as a historical narrative, where we're looking at from slavery to freedom, the kinds of ways that we picked up things in the black church about what was supposed to be our sorts of things, we didn't realize were coming from evangelicals. So for instance, the ideas about marriage, about you know virginity, about all of these things that get sacralized in the church. And you can see them in scriptures. I'm not fighting with nobody on scriptures today, but we use them to bludgeon our own people and to keep our people in subjection. And so when we start talking about in the 70s, when everybody decides that, you know, we're gonna be against homosexuality now, and we're gonna start talking about that in a certain kind of way, we're gonna model ourselves after these white evangelical leaders who talk about this and adopt their same kind of language to vilify the people in our pews and in our churches, that's another way that this happened. And then we began to take on the whole thing about abortion, right? So that all of those things flowed into black churches, especially in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and how the ways in which black churches sort of centered themselves around this. But at the same time, what it ended up doing was harnessing votes for white Republicans. So when you get to 2000 and 2004, when you get George Bush talking about compassionate consumers, conservatism and fooling everybody because it wasn't about compassion. It was about giving certain pastors money so that they could be able to bring votes in in Ohio, right? Where a whole bunch of black people are. That is the way they got you. That is the way they've turned you. And so when we bring this forward to look at 2016 and Donald Trump, where he assembled the D list, and I do mean the D list, of, evan of these evangelical Pentecostal D list preachers, to come on board and support him and fool everybody and make him th everybody think that he was into you know being integrational and all this other stuff that was a lie because basically they perpetuated the same kind of racist values that republicans and white evangelicals had and so what i'm trying to show in this book is to show you how morality gets used as a weapon to pretend have people pretend that white evangelicals are the moral agents in society when in fact they're using that morality to control other people, first of all, to garner votes secondly, and to third and most importantly, raise money for the kinds of things that they want to have happen. May I add something? Because this is the part of it that is oxy oxymoronic to me. Donald Trump does not have to live holy. He gets a pass. He's their person uh, and their example of the prophet. They called him Elijah and several other things. But he is not required by these people who have been toting this concept of holiness and right living for God knows how long now. He is completely exempt from holiness. They know he steals, they know he lies, they know that he abuses women till yet and pays them off. They know that he cheats. They know that his taxes are a disaster. They know that he destroyed a great part of New Jersey and the workers and the contractors there. They know his school was a lie. His clothing store was a lie. His real estate business was a lie. And everyone that supports him basically knows that, but he gets a free pass to sin all he wants, as much and with whom he wants, with no repentance, because he don't repent. It's not in him to repent. And somehow or other, the greatest support that he gets is from the evangelical conservative church. Can you just say a little something about how oxymoronic that is to anyone who is looking for God. It, it's not oxymoronic. I'm, I'm going to tell you that it fits right in with their theology. Because once you understand that white men are exempt from everything, including Donald Trump, okay, all of them, then, then you understand how this happens. Because see, here's the thing. They will always say Donald Trump was the man that was chosen by God. And this is why they called him King Cyrus. Y'all remember all this when they called him King Cyrus and King Cyrus saved the Israelites and everything. This is who they compare him to. 
And so they're going to say, well, God can use a sinner to do what he needs to do. So while everybody thought back in October of 2016 that all that stuff he had said about grabbing women and all this was going to stop everything, all they needed to do was to say, well, God forgave him. He is sorry. He is repentant. And so they use the very theology that they tell you that is going to try to save you, but they won't give you that same repentance. Understand, you're not going to get that because you're black and, and God's not going to forgive you. But if you're white and if you're a white rich man, and let's put rich in front of it, you can give forgiveness for everything. And so one of the things I, I think is really important to understand this is not just theologically, but understanding how they talk about it politically. And my friend, Jeff Charlotte, who wrote a book called The Family, said one of the things that they talk about is that, you know, when you have a strong man, God can use a strong man and God doesn't need that person to be saved. What God needs is somebody that is going to work for his people and do everything they want. So let, let me bring it home for you. Donald Trump gave white evangelicals everything they wanted. See, some of y'all can't get what you want from, uh, from Biden right now, but you can get it from Donald Trump because Donald Trump promised them he was going to protect evangelicals. He was going to give them Supreme Court justices. He was going to give them favorable things. He was going to make sure their money was right. And all of that stuff came to pass for them while the rest of everybody else suffered. Oh, and yes, he was going to keep the immigrants out. And his, his policies are still working right now. So you once, once you understand that what is good for, for thee is not for them, then you understand that this is two, theology on two tracks, one for the, for the low people down here and the theology for the white folks up here. I need to stop. There we go. I started going into the White House under Herbert W. Bush back in the 80s or whenever he was president. I forget exactly. Um, I think it was in the latter part of the 80s. And I sat with uh, a group of preachers, black preachers. If I named them, you'd know all, almost every single one of them for the faith based initiative that came through with George Jr. <laughs> and they offered us 10 million apiece. To, to form a group. Can I say that out loud? Damn. Okay. Yeah, they am. I wish. Yeah. And we were going to be, be their voices to the black community and enhance the conservative agenda. They took me when I first went in, they showed me an agenda. They showed me my uh, uh, a whole file they had on me as a black preacher. And as a, I said, why do you have a file on me? They said, well, because you're high profile. You're on television. We know all of you. We know your audiences. We know what your attendance is. We know what your budgets are, how much money comes in, where you put your money on Sundays, what banks you all use. And they gave, they showed me Schuler and Graham and Oral and anybody that was on television. And they said, we need you. And, and we're going to protect your interests as Christians. And they cycle and they, and I was, I was impressed with their protection of the evangelical fundamentalist Christian mentality. That's how they got to us. And I, it was a few years after that that I began to realize it was all manipulation and they were all going to try to control us through the faith-based initiative. And we bought into it because it seemed Jesus. Now, for the black church's support of people like Trump, the black church has been the easiest money, the quickest and fastest money that black people have earned in this country culturally. We just now having billionaires and multimillionaires, but preachers were the first millionaires. Men that grew up in the sticks of Arkansas and, and, and Alabama died millionaires. So the church was sacred. Jesus was sacred. The Holy Ghost, the scriptures, fundamentalism, that whole thing, it's been a living for us. And so they, they, they're, 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 they're not fast or quick to let it go because it means they lose all this money. They were fat belly, excuse the terminology, redneck guys with fat checkbooks writing checks to us. And to this day, millionaire white evangelicals are underwriting or helping to support black prominent ministers and ministries to keep them in the camp. They want to make people like me or others giants within the movement so that when we speak, our people listen to us. They do that in the secular world too. A lot of the black artists and entertainers and celebrities are supported by, in, by agendas that keep them the celebrities. So when they say we need a black voice or a black vote, they get it. They have sat in rooms like we're talking and thought this through, strategized, 
how to keep us in the camp. So white evangelical motives, which is based in slavery and enslavement of the people, save them and enslave them or enslave them, then save them, but keep them fearing God, fearing the devil and fearing the white man and thinking it's holy. I mean, it's a psychological ploy that has worked and a lot of black preachers bought into. We, we listened to what Massa taught us. We learned how to read, how to speak English by reading the King James Version of the Bible. So that's steeped in us for 400 years and it's gonna take a while, but you can never learn without unlearning. And so we cannot have evolution without des de desolution. We have to dissolve some things, unlearn some things, stop lugging the luggage we've carried. And even if that means reassessing what we believe and why we believe it and how those beliefs add to or subtract from the quality of our lives as a people, this is a new day and it's gonna be very uh, almost violent or at least a violation of certain state principles that we have adhered to to keep the white man happy with us. It's in our mind, don't upset the white man. Watch out, white man to get you. White man, I heard that from my pastor when I was a kid. Don't touch that son, the white man to get you. The white man to get you, the white man to get you. And the white man got us. <laughs> and they own us. And people like us have wiggled out, squealed out, screamed out, and others are coming, but we need to do exactly what we're doing now, call up, Pardon the, pardon the pun, a spade a spade or a spatula a spatula and get it out there loud and clear. They use money, they use manipulation and we have bought into it. And some of us are saying no more. So Dr. Butler, Bishop Pearson, Bishop Flunder, we, we have laid the groundwork for this book and why you wrote it. But here's the real question. What do we need to do to get out of this, to get our people, because this is not a conversation about salvation. This is a conversation about liberation. What do we need to do to free our people from, it's a disease, from this disease? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I would say to anybody, first of all, if the things you're hearing tonight are shocking to you, you need to begin to not just read, but to ask yourself what's going on in your home church. How is your pastor maybe sold out? How are the people around you not doing anything in their communities? How is it that you keep listening to the same things and wanting to go to the same conventions and doing all that same old stuff that you've been doing that has not forwarded anything about A, the kingdom of God, or B, the black community in which you live in, or whatever community you might be living in? What is it that keeps you from moving forward in what you are supposed to do because you are sitting up under a pastor who is either a pawn for somebody. And I think Bishop Pearson just laid that out really well because a lot of these pastors right now that folks talk about they love their preaching and everything else are just puppets for other people who are buying their money so that they can fly around in their little jets despite COVID, okay? So you need to ask yourself that first. The second thing you need to ask yourself is where are you putting your money? Because basically what you need to understand is you are part of an ecosystem of money that is fueling money to other things. And I know people gonna say, well, I pay my tithe and my offerings and everything else. Where is your tithe and offering going to? Is it in the local church? Is it to focus on the family or family research council or you know all these other people, the American Family Association or any one of these other myriads of organizations that are doing nothing but paying lobbyists to continue to oppress you in the black community. This is what you need to think about because if your money is, is not going, it might be going to St. John's knit suit or, uh, or the, the jet, but it also might be going to some of these white, you know, organizations that are pretending that they are helping you when in fact they are, you know, binding you up. The third thing is, is how do you understand who to vote for? Are you getting your votes and your information from your pastor who is getting it from a sheet of paper from some organization that's telling you that certain people are bad and other people you shouldn't vote for. And this, you know, this happened starting with Christian Coalition in the early 1990s and it's still going on right now. How are you finding out that information? What are you letting into your ears? What are you searching for? And what kind of, uh, of people that you say, well, they have my values. Well, what values do they really have? Are they, do they have values that are helping in the community, that are helping to reduce police you know, abuse and violence? Or are they sending you a Blue Lives Matter flag in the mail and telling you that you need to pray for the police when the police are kneeling on black men's necks and killing them? These are the kind of questions you have to ask yourself. 
Because I think first you have to examine where you are before you can get free to move. And you know, I'm sure Bishop Pearson and Bishop Flunder have things to say about this, but I'm just telling you, some of you are stuck where you are and can't see that you have been had, you've been duped and you've been bamboozled by white evangelicals. All right, Bishop Flunda, Bishop Pearson, which one? Well, I'll weigh in just a little bit and say this, that the other day it came up in the news, it was uh, Duplessis, um, that evangelical- Duplantis. Duplantis, yes. Duplantis, Help, thank you, Bishop. South African, originally, as I recall. Um, but he was, yeah, he was having a great big, big meeting. And I know Bishop Carlton uh, knows who he is and what his, he's a multimillionaire, I know that. And in the meeting, what he's trying to do is, is get uh, evangelicals all over the world to increase their fiscal war ch chest. Uh, apparently, the people are not giving the way that they did some time ago. Um, and they're trying to find out why has the giving fallen off. And so he is working very hard. And so a couple of days ago, um, he was heard to say and recorded to say that Jesus was delaying his return to the earth because the people are not giving like they really should. Now, I've heard a lot of different things, scams and scamations that have been used. We have blessed water and blessed cloths and blessed food and, and, and it's just so many things. But this one, that Jesus is delaying his return because the people will not give, that we basically have to pay Jesus. We have got to pay Jesus to come back. And he's pissed and he's mad and pouting in some way because he's not being properly, properly rather paid. I thought that of all of the routines that I have heard of all of the interesting fundraising miscellaneous that I've heard, this one was connected to the second coming. And so I turned, I told Shelly, I said, first, we got to pay Jesus to come back. Let's start with that. We got to pay him to come back. Second thing, if we don't pay him, he's going to pout. And he's not going to come back because he's upset. But the third thing, which is the most, that touched me the most deeply, is that would people actually respond to something like that? And if they are responding to something like that, it has become worse than in, it has ever been in my thinking, if this is having an impact. And I, and I said this one other thing to myself that these people have come to believe so much in this concept and this way and this trick in terms of gathering people by this trick that they see themselves be believing so much in what they believe that they can demand people and now demand God. And I hope you understand what it is that I'm saying, that they can actually believe in it so much that they demand that God agree with what it is that they have come to believe and put it on God. <laughs> put their request concepts and ways and mannerisms on God. Change God's nature if necessary to make God fall in line politically and financially with what it is that they want. Now, I'm not a, a, um, a conspiracy theorist. I am not one of those people that needs to come up with an apocalyptic answer to all of what it is that I'm seeing. But I am pretty sure that this is a death toll for white evangelicalism and those who will ascribe to it. This is moving the needle a little bit, well, a great bit farther than anything that I've experienced in my long time being connected in some way to conservative Christianity. So I just want to put that out there. Here's, here's one of the, the ploys behind that, Bishop. Uh, men like him and a lot of the great evangelists, so-called great evangelists, are not getting 
uh, invitation. They cannot pull the crowds into the convention centers and the large arenas anymore. So they got to depend on churches. That statement was made to appeal to preachers, pastors more than laity. So pastors could invite them in so they could say that to their congregations. So the people would give more tithe and give more offering in the local churches. These guys are make their living off of speaking. So because many, he's in his 70s now, Copeland's in his 80s, their partners are falling off, have been dying for years, they're older, they don't use the internet, they don't use social media, they don't use their cell phones, and they're not writing checks and sending them in the mail anymore. And the numbers are, are getting small. So these guys are panicking. Now the only way they can get a big offering is to go into a church and du Duplantis is from New Orleans. You would think of Duplantis. He was the one from South Africa. Duplantis lives in New Orleans. He's funny. He's witty. He's not doesn't have a lot of depth in his teaching, but he's very entertaining. And the people have loved him. But their their partner base has fallen by tens of thousands. And so they now got to go into churches. And so they got to impress the preacher that if I come to your church, I'm gonna fire your people up and make them start tithing again, giving again. But then I'll get my big cut and I'll go to the next church. So again, the love and or lack of money is the root of all evil again. And that's what is that's in the black church and in the church at large. Money, control, power, manipulation, uh, intimidation. That's all at work. We haven't had a spiritual move in the church in decades. There hasn't been a quote unquote move of the Holy Ghost where people really get transformed in so long, nobody even thinks about that. They they fight the gays, what, what they call the gays and abortionists. That's their two big deals. They have nothing to say about love, forgiveness, mercy, <laughs> kindness, benevolence, charity, keep the black folks out, the people of color from, from immigration. Uh, they're so off. I've never seen them so obscured and confused and brainwashed. And so this is something that we must observe. We can't really change it right now. All we can do is bring attention to it. It will it will change itself. But this whole movement, that whole manifestation has to, to, to dwindle away, die down. Younger people, I'll, I'll say, are no longer going following this in, in huge numbers. They're leaving by the hundreds of thousands. Young people say, I don't believe what my grandparents believe. I don't believe my parents. I don't want to go to church. I don't even want to go to Christian churches or Christian schools. I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to be associated. It's guilt by association. I'm not one of them. I don't want to even be called a Christian. So the whole thing is shriveling in front of us. There's a lot of, there's a lot of implosion and that's uh, sort of under the ground, we can't see it. It's rock in the church, but the explosion, mark my word, in the next few months, you're going to see a public display of the rock that's in the church. You're going to be all this hypocrisy. A lot of these guys are going to be, the Southern Baptist Church just voted in to finally confront sexual harassment and abuse within the movement. Hundreds of pastors and hundreds of churches have been sued quietly for sexual abuse. All these righteous people. Trump is just is no no worse than a lot of these preachers. There's thousands of them that are abusing, that are paying for abortions, that are uh, having same gender loving uh, attractions, but they're married with children and they're screwing around. Excuse the terminology. There's a lot of rot out there. That's all going to come into public display in the next few months. Mark my word. It's going to stun and stagger the whole movement, and then a glorious upheaval of truth and peace and love will come again. I just need to say one thing. I, I want to thank Bishop Flunder for bringing up Jesse Duplantis because basically you just gave me an example for my class, God and Money, because uh, I, I I think this is the perfect way to just sit here, especially with what Bishop Pearson just said about how they twist God up to make God do what they want to do. It's about it's not about theology. When evangelicals tell you this is about theology, they lie it. OK, because they don't even understand their own theology. Let's let's just put that down right now, because I think that's really the key. If you could say that, you go, you know, Jesus ain't coming back until y'all pay up. It's like Jesus is a mobster waiting for you to pay up your, your you know, your feet so that he'll come back and he won't jack you up in the house. If you don't pay, I'm going to send you to hell. I ain't coming back. You know what? Kind, what? What Jesus is that? Jesus is a mobster. Jesus is a drug dealer. I, I mean, I don't understand. And who is Duplantis? Is he, is he the heavy? 
So, I mean, I, I've been watching Jesse D. Play this for a long time, Bishop we, Bishop Pearson. We, you and I could talk about all these folks till the cows come home. But it's the same grift, and they stay grifted. And this is what the grift is. And you are right. What the coronavirus has done is broken all of them down to the white meat, no pun intended. And now their, their pockets are getting slim, and the moths are coming out of their wallets, and they're trying to figure out how we're going to get the next thing going. Yep. And they haven't figured out the internet yet. Their people ain't on the internet. And they've been killed half of their people with coronavirus because they told them not to get the damn shot. <laughs> how are you going to kill your own people so you can't get no money? I'm just asking. So true. <laughs> We're no always not detected. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> I love it. Okay, you know, I love you know, I I love this one. Okay, <laughs> well, okay. So 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 I, I know I'm all in your stuff, Bishop Elect Vanessa. But then we so then we push this thing to all right. What do we have to offer now? That is an alternative. Yes. Because what what I believe we have done is named the problem, and it is mega. This is not a small issue. We are confronted with, with crazy religion right now and confronted with a pandemic, to your point. Incredible racism, lots of gun toting, all kinds of political junk, machinations, tricks, all kinds of plans to take away our freedom to vote, take away a woman's right to choose, disconnect all of our international connections that have proven to be helpful to the whole world and planet historically. Mm. That's all coming up from these same conservative Please. evangelical Christian camps. Now, what do we offer or what can we offer or what are we willing to offer as an alternative to what it is that is being said and done in our current world. I wrote two books emphasizing radical inclusion as opposed to exclusion. To put out our arms, the word inclusion really means enclosure. It comes from putting your arm around and leaving no soul behind. Everybody is loved and embraced as they are. And uh, of course, a lot of the evangelists don't even read that book. Then I wrote another book called God is Not a Christian, nor Jew, Hindu, Muslim. God is with us, around us, as us, expressing itself. And so we're offering, this program offers something. We're offering alternatives. But you have to be willing to repent and or what the word means, rethink. I've been saying it every week. Why do you believe what you believe? Uh, re reconsider what you believe, why you believe it and how those beliefs add to or subtract from the quality of your life. That may mean leaving your church. That may, be, that may mean reinterpreting scripture or finding someone with a more broad interpretation of it uh, to become more progressive spiritually and to, and to be willing to let go some dogmas and to get away from fear-based theologies. I think religion as we've known it for the last, at least the last 2000 years has to change and will be abandoned. It will dissipate and in the next 50 to 100 years disappear. And technology and mysticism or spirituality is going to come together, science and a prayer and a different way in meditation. That's happening as we speak. The church doesn't see it or refuses to acknowledge it. But there's another movement besides the church, and we are just slight representations of it. Some of those people wouldn't, there are millions of people that will never darken the door of a church again since COVID. They're just not going to do it. I get calls from preachers every day saying, what are we going to do, doc? We don't even want to go back to church. We glad we have our Sundays off. You people sitting at home in the drawers, listening to somebody preach on television. You know, somebody sitting up next to his wife, pinching it and squeezing it out and quickening in between. So uh, they're getting some kind of spiritual nourishment, but they don't want to do church the same way. Some will, many will, millions will, but tens of millions won't. And so it's going to take a while for it to, to fizzle out. But it, the change is occurring. Let's keep offering this. I'm now about to launch a full streaming consciousness network where this program will be on it, this weekly sharing, this kinds of conversation will be on it. 
progressive thinkers, liberals, uh, the so-called liberals, people who are what I call cultural creatives, uh, spiritual progressives, sacred humanists with a mind and a brain and a mouth are going to start talking and, and exposing an alternative. The people will change, but we need to offer positive, powerful, productive, practical alternatives. And that's our endeavor with gatekeepers each week. And we're going to continue this. There's a huge following out there and they're getting larger every day. I would say a couple of things really quickly about what, what you can do. First of all, if you find yourself in these kinds of situations or you got friends or family in these kinds of situations, you need to start talking to them now because basically they are in bondage to a system that is continually to, to crush them and will not get them to heaven because it don't matter because they got hell right here on earth. That's that's number one. You need to get out and get some people out. That's that's the thing I would say. You start reading things that are going to help you move forward. Number two, you need to prepare for 2022 because we got a battle on our hands. It's not just about this. These evangelicals are going to be fighting through the through the polls where they have told you that you can't go and vote, where they are taking away all of your your rights that have been earned, that that have been that were there for you since the Voting Rights Act and everything else. And they trying to roll you back to 1860, now, 1860 at the start of the Civil War. You need to wake up and realize that those people that you support or you think you support or those that you used to support and didn't support anymore are not here for your human flourishing. They are here to destroy you. They are here to make you slaves to what they want. And then the last thing is, and this is going to sound like a strange thing to say, but I think this is really true. You need to pay attention to what is happening with climate change and start trying to figure out what we're going to do about this, because we are all susceptible to this. To anybody who lives on the coast of America right now, you are you you have been under floods. You know, Jesse Duplantis is talking about God ain't going to come bring no money. Well, look at what happened in Louisiana. Why is he not in La Platte? Why is he not in all those communities right now that were underwater, where people were standing on houses hoping that they were going to get saved? No, he worried about Jesus getting paid to come back. That's just ridiculous. That man needs to be uh, just, just wiped out because I don't understand why you would say something like this when all the people around the place that you live in have been flooded out and destroyed through natural disasters that are going to keep coming, whether there's fires in California, and I'm sure Bishop Flunder knows about this, fires. We haven't even hit the winter yet. We've had people that were washed away from Ida here on the East Coast. Thank you very much. Okay. All of these things are signs that we need to pay attention to what the earth is trying to tell us, which is the earth is sick of us and we have made the earth sick and we need to be paying attention to what's going on. So all of this is of a piece. And at the core of it are evangelicals recalcitrance, their racism, their inability to pay attention to science and the pandemic that is killing people left and right and center, which they continue to pretend like is not happening. There's a real question in the, in the chat that touches me very deeply. And that is, Someone, someone talked about us coming out with a basically a new canon, and it's something that has been in my mind for many, many years. And I am aware of the the pushback that we have. I, I have real problems with with the the canon that is our canon. I have real problems with trying to make this some scripture work. Or even when I spend the hard work that I've spent in theological school and institutions, both as a student and as a professor, how do I even touch this and act like this is holy writ when everything about it is extremely problematic, extremely centered on one people, extremely centered on an angry and, and constantly sensitive alcoholic father type God? You know, how is it that I can continue to use it? And, and, you know, things get sanctified with time. And the real concern that I have is that we don't have enough courage. And, and I am watching even the people that I encourage in the theological education try to come up with a way to make some things all right. And they're simply not all right. They killed Jesus because he said it wasn't all right. They put Jesus in prison because he said it wasn't all right. You heard it said of all this and that and this and that, but verily, we need a verily moment. 
Verily I say unto you, <laughs> we gotta get, we gotta get some verilies together. We gotta take some of this writing. We got to call a table at something, a table at Atlanta, a table at Chicago, a table at, and we need to begin the work of writing for our children's future of the flesh and spirit. Pull it together, pray over it, which is all they did. Pull it together, pray over it, and give it time to sink in because they are going to need something more than constant apology for what we call the word of God. I am tired of apologizing for the violence and the bloodshed and the misinterpretation and the wrong concepts, wrong ideas, wrong thoughts, wrong perceptions of God and doing that from what I call the word of God. There's no way in the world that all of the words in the book are the word of God. There's no way in the world that that's possible. We know that. And our generation, I believe, is obligated to do something for the generations that are following this. I hear you. I hear you. And the question is a good question and a proper question for the time that we are living. I just want to make a statement because we just were talking about Jesse DePlantis. And I want him, if somebody shares this with him and his wife, to know, since they live in New Orleans, Louisiana, they need to understand and they should know that the garbage is not being picked up in Louisiana and the stench is ungodly. If you want to do something, send money to those people so that they can get that trash out because that stench and all of that and that trash not being picked up is not going to do anything but cause sickness and death. So if you want to use your money to do something wisely, use that money to help clean Louisiana up. That's my statement right there on that. Chances are they these guys are probably doing something that we don't know about. They're they're pretty generous. I know Duplantis and Copeland, all of the some of the most generous men I know, but they are insensitive to practical living any longer and some of the pain. They do things sort of by, by remote. It's not always a focused attention. Had he said just what you just said, uh, Bishop elect. Had he said that instead of what he said about the second coming and all that, that would have changed the whole situation. People would start giving to him and supporting more. But he said something stupid. And but he, he thought he was triggering pastors. He was thinking about getting more money. It's not that they don't give because they're all very generous givers and very liberal and they give millions away. But they say the stupid stuff and they have stupid thoughts that don't fit anymore. And so they're sort of running out of that money. Not the money that they have, but the money that they're collecting. It's just not coming into them anymore. So they're supposed to believe if you sow, you're going to reap. But they don't, they're don't. not reaping the harvest they want, so they're manipulating. They call themselves the word of faith movement, but they're actually talking the word of fear. Their fear that money has stopped coming in. It will continue to come in. So they're panicking, and they say uh, uh, ludicrous statements like that. That's where I would pick up the phone and call them and say, back off, brother. I know you, I love you, I've respected you. We're not close, but stop that foolishness. It's hurting you. Change your emphasis. Show us doing exactly what you said, Bishop Elect. Let them see him out there in the streets with his cameras. If you're gonna raise money, raise money for this cause. Do exactly what you said, but show the people that instead of that asinine statement he made. These guys are just stupid. I, I hate to use that terminology because they're men of God. We're just people. All of us are men and women of God. You know, but some of us are stupid and that was a stupid statement and it hurts and they need to be told that, but they're not accountable to anybody. The church, these preachers get by with all this silly stuff because they're not accountable. They're angry. They're frustrated. They're suffering cognitive dissonance. They know that their lives are inconsistent with what they say they believe. They know what they believe, but they don't believe what they know. And they're, they're confused. Marriages are falling apart. Kids are in rebellion. Uh, the church is now, the preachers are more insecure about people liking them. Even though the money may be good through the internet, they're used to saying, I can get no help up in here. Turn to your neighbor and say, and ain't no neighbor to turn to. I mean, ain't no crowd there. Ain't nobody saying amen to them and tell them how wonderful they are. So they're freaking out. They need to hear somebody telling them how wonderful. One of the things that Bishop, you know that as well as I, when, I'm, when we're on that stage and we're in our flow, it's almost a, a sensual, sexual, as well as spiritual 
high. It's climactic. We get these pitch high moments when everybody's sweating and hollering and screaming and rolling. And, and it's, 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 it's intoxicating. Absolutely. When that goes away, we, we feel impotent and less important. <laughs> so a lot of it's psychological. It's not all spiritual. A lot of it's just psych. Our, our psychology needs to change. Our psych logic needs to change. And I'm saying we need some group therapy. And I know mm -hmm. there may be people, ministers, watching this and listening to this, or we'll hear about it, and it will be therapy. That might make them angry at first. Yeah. Your book, uh, Professor Butler, ticked some people off, but it also turned a lot of people on. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes that's what it takes. So keep writing, keep talking. You're free. You can say, you, you, exactly. what I like about you is you can cuss if you want to. Ain't that beautiful? And, you know, I, I sometimes I think I'm speaking in tongues of my kids telling daddy, you was cussing. I said, well, I, I got twisted up. There. Well, you know, Bishop Pierce, I want to tell you something. My my mentor, um, who was a Swiss theologian, Walter Hollenweger, said very something very important to me when I was in graduate school. He said, you need to finish up that PhD because they could take a ministerial license, but they cannot take your PhD from you. And Thank I you. always remembered that. Bam. And he was right. Bishop Flunder, you are probably the most scholarly, active minister in the pulpit with tremendous acad academic background and proficiency. You're one of the most intelligent, verbally, articulate, smart thinkers. If there's anybody who can rewrite and reinterpret and retranslate scripture, it's you. I'll donate as much as I can toward that effort. You can pull together some brilliant progressive thinkers. And just like they did 400 years ago, and of course they've changed the King, G King James, they've, 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 re they've um, translated it 40,000 different times. You can come up with something that may be one of the most important works of your life uh, to begin to pull the team together and start retranslating it. And we'll push it. It's very important for you to do that if you're so inclined. I, You have my support and I'll pull a lot of people in line to help you do that. This is a great day. It we're is. going to talk. We're going to talk more. I have I have the, uh, in my mind a concept of epistles that are subject based. Wow. Where there's one about women, there's one about human sexuality, there's one what? about the environment, there's one about politics and policy. But I think that we need some living epistles, really living epistles. And my hope is that we will do that for the generations. And I'm going to take you up on it, Bishop. I'll be calling you Professor Butler. We will chat. All right. would. Wouldn't it be great if women started it and, and, and it's the female oh, essence, it's your day to be big and broad, large and in charge. You outnumber us in every way. There are more females in seminary. There are more females in medical school. Uh, it's, it's time for the feminine essence to be pronounced, announced and expanded. And so I think you, there's not even, there's not one book of the Bible written by a female. It's all men. Even Esther is not women. So men got together for 300 years, arguing, drinking, and getting drunk, trying to decide what would be in the canon. So I'm going to really mess with you tonight and just tell you that we're not really quite sure who the author of Hebrew is, and Hebrews might be a woman. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's a good point. Sounds like she, she's the one that says uh, uh, to leave the fundamental teachings about Christ and go on to spiritual perfection. Didn't say abandon it, but don't be stuck there. Leave Christian fundamentalism is what that scripture says to me. Yeah. And go yeah. on to spiritual maturity. And it shouldn't be stuck on tablets. That's that's the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one I really like. Yeah. That it should that it is written on the heart, which means it can evolve. That's right. That's, that's, that's another it. conversation to have. But mm -hmm. my God, we set that one up, Bishop Elect Brown. Okay. Let's, let's talk about what that yeah. is. Indeed. Oh. Now, no, no, no. we've got Dr. Butler here and we've got some questions and we want to just, you know, if you have questions, I need you to come on because we don't want to have her here all night. She's got classes to teach. But here is one that says, can we adequately argue that white evangelicalism can be partially responsible for the great divide and so many measurable elements in America KKK? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is what my book is all about, is how they have divided the, the, 
the political scene and everything else by the ways and the manner in which they have used morality to put these divisions into people and into society in America today. I mean, I think that is the argument of my entire book. You can read it. It's an easy, fast read. You know, there's no footnotes. I have an apparatus in the back if you want to read further. But I think I present a very convincing case about the ways in which they have divided everyone and continue to do so because they are into divide and conquer. And so they are using the Bible as a shield and a, and a weapon to beat people up with and to make them submit to the things that they want in this society that they are not gonna follow anyway. I mean, I think we've proven tonight by our conversation that while they're trying to tell everybody to not get an abortion and you know, don't sleep with nobody else and everything else. They are paying off everybody that they possibly can. I mean, this is this is not un unusual. We could I could go through the litany of all of these leaders who have messed up. So Donald Trump was not anybody that was you know anonymous. And somebody in the qu in the question said, "Is this because of Donald Trump?" This was going on long before Donald Trump. You need to understand something. Donald Trump is just the end result of years and years and years of all of this mess. It's he's, not about Trump. He's the symptom, not the source. That's right. He's a symptom of, of how sick we have become. And we need to use a little bit of those harsh terms. If it, if it upsets people, you know, it's a law of physics. Anything in motion causes friction. If we're going to move, we got to be willing because freedom is not for cowards. You got to have courage to say the kinds of things we're saying and to stick with it. And even at the risk of losing things, including friends, sometimes family. I don't like you anymore, but uh, it'll it'll come around. We got to be willing to make, uh, as what uh, uh, John Lewis, the late John Lewis said, make good trouble, get in good trouble, create good trouble, trouble the waters. Elijah was called the troubler of Israel, the greatest prophet in scripture, at least. And so let's let's trouble the waters and uh, make a difference. I think it's very important that we, because we didn't name it, we talk, but they had a big thing to do with purity culture and purity culture and how what we need to talk about is how it's harmed women. It didn't help. It's harmed women. That's purity or Puritan? Purity, P-U-R-I-T-Y, purity culture. It's not unlike what is happening with the Taliban. Just And, and I know that there's a connection that, that, um, that Dr. Butler can also sense and see. This, this putting women back behind a, a wall, essentially, yeah. and and taking them, encouraging them not to be in education in many cases, because all they are doing is trying to protect their hymen so that the package can be opened by the husband. That's the whole concept of keeping them back and behind and covered. In the purity culture, the whole idea of, of, of wearing a purity bracelet, or wearing a purity ring to demonstrate that you have not, that, that your hymen is intact. One of the things that it made um, opened up a whole lot of is anal sex. If you just allow me to, to tell you the truth and, and oral sex, because you could keep your hymen. That's another day. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> But you, you still got to intact. That's when you need to bring me back on because I can let's lay this out for everybody. And, and let me just yes. say one more thing. Purity culture is a bazillion dollar business in this country. All of this stuff, these purity rings, these purity balls, all of this stuff. This was a money maker in the 80s and 90s and beyond. And all this uh, teach uh, my I could just I, I'm going to wait. You know, Josh McDowell did all this stuff. Um, I can't remember the other dude. I kissed Dayton goodbye, and he now he divorced. He didn't kiss everything goodbye, and he out there. So, I mean, you know, don't let people try to fool you with all this stuff because basically this too is part of the con. Plus, I, I mean, we had, that was real big in our church, and I'm, I'm not de denouncing or denying it, but a lot of those with the purity rings had babies out of wedlock, but some of them dudes had two or three. They, I mean, they would leave the purity celebration in ghost group <laughs> that same night. So, um, and I found that in those days that, that was very bothersome to me. Now I realize it's pretty much a norm. And uh, and that, as you said, uh, Dr. Butler, they were just using that and it was very fancy. I like a lot of the things the evangelicals say. It's fancy, it's appealing, but it's empty in reality. From the pulpit to the usher, to the, to the usher board is 
it's it's uh, it's fake in so many many yes. thousands of incidences. And and it is not the the church was not support of in support of teaching young people not to abhor their sexuality. Or yeah, good. But, and and how to have a real sensible logical conversation about how to come into your intimacy. And I'll say it again. Most of us came into sex and sexuality as a crapshoot. It was just a mess. It was a mess because nobody would really talk to you. The only thing they say is don't. Don't doesn't, your hormones don't understand don't. And the concept, the idea of demonizing and vilifying just made people go another way. So yes, I think we need to have a real conversation about the beauty of human sexuality and our young people are finding those answers somewhere else other than in the realities of the church. Another day, Bishop elect, but a very important conversation. And yes, please bring Bishop Pearson and I are asking you, please bring professor, Dr. Anthea Butler back and let's talk about this. All right. How are you? Absolutely. Last question, Dr. Butler, and we're going to close it up and I, and I need to make sure uh, that our Facebook Live audience and all the other social media platforms are still with us. Why do we continue to allow them to play the role of God in our lives? We talk and write very good opinions, but they seem to get halfway to the finish line. Dr. Butler and everybody else can also. Well, I'm just going to be quick. I'm I'm going to speak for myself. Once you start to learn things, you walk out. And I started learning and I walked out. I didn't look back. Okay. Yeah. Because basically, you know, it's it, it, what you're just doing by stating the question this way. Why do we allow to the, uh, continue to allow them to play the role of God in our lives? Well, I, you don't allow anybody to do anything you don't want them to do. So you need to examine yourself and decide where is that happening in your life? rather than putting that on everyone else. Where is that happening in your life? And and I know that's gonna sound harsh, but I'm gonna call the question for you and say, you were asking that question because you were trying to figure out how to get out yourself. (laughs) It's true. Well, Well, I can tell you mine quick too. I I can tell you mine because I'm a person who knows and understands exile. Um, I'm not the only one, but yes, you have to walk away. There are things that you can't change. You have to change it from the outside. And my the other half of it for me is to create something on the margins that is better, that is more powerful, that is more uh, God-breathed, that can be an alternative for those of us who are leaders and will remain leaders even when we walk away. I think what we have to do is create or become a part of. And when you become a part of something that is fresh and new, it has all of the issues. You don't have the numbers. You don't have the money. You perhaps don't have the platform, but you do it anyway, Mm -hmm. because that is what reformation really looks like. I'm sorry. I'm doing what I tell y'all not to do. I want to let you all have your final thoughts tonight. And so I'm going to start. I'm going to end with uh, Dr. Butler. I'm going to start with Bishop Pearson, go to Bishop Flunder, then Dr. Butler. Final thoughts, final words. Mm -hmm. The the church as we have known it for the last 2000 years, at least, is in dissolution more than evolution. A lot of things are dissolving in front of our very eyes, including idolizing scripture. And uh, which is scripture says, thou shalt have no graven image. And scripture is a graven image. And if if God intended for us to have the original manuscripts, we'd have them, we don't. We only have copies of copies of copies. So we don't even know what the original writings were. I don't call it the inspired word of God as much as I call it the inspired word of men and no women about God, unless the Hebrew writer was female. Women were kept out, they were cut out, they were cut down. And so we had to reconsider all of that. It's validity, it's historicity, not just translation, but transliteration. And I know that's hard for people because the Bible really is an idol and it's done a lot of harm 
much good, of course, but a lot of harm, a lot of violation, a lot of destruction. So let's reconsider all of this. This is important. In fact, it's imperative. We have to do it. We're being forced to do it because things are not going to be the same, not even the scriptures, especially when you write your epistles, Bishop. Just the way you said it, that's enough. I mean, just do those subjects. That's the commission. I believe the Lord has anointed me to tell you to do it. Get it done. I love you all. And, and, and Dr. Butler, let me just tell you, you're one of the most courageous voices we have out there. You see things, you sense things, and you say them. And that is actually more important than seeing and sensing. You say it. You said boldly. You said courageously. Uh, there's nothing cowardly about you. The scripture says God has not given us a spirit of fear. That word means timidity. There's nothing timid about you. I love your strength. I love your poise. I love your freedom. And it's helping and encouraging us also. Keep up the good works. Keep on writing them books. Thank you, Bishop. Bishop Flunder. Simply that this was a wonderful conversation. Just a very powerful conversation. I'm, 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 I feel blessed. I feel humbled. I feel uh, inspired. Um, I feel a yes that's sort of down in my belly. Um, I've had that yes before, and uh, dangerous things happen when I <laughs> when I feel it. But I feel a yes. Um, I think that part of what the gatekeepers has been called to do is to pull together some incredible writers, some incredible thinkers, but prophets for our time. And I want to encourage everyone. Um, I, there's two books, and these and these are they. Can you see that? Okay. Anthea Butler and Aubrey Hendricks. Okay, I don't want you to miss these. I want you to see these. And it does not mean that we haven't had an enormous, enormous amount of authors, but uh, white evangelical racism and Christians against Christianity. These books have said so much about our coming future. And it's, as Bishop Pearson said, closer than our breath. These are anointed people and anointed, like my Pentecostal self understands anointing, such that the oil has been poured on their heads and it's run down and it's, and it's dripping off their chins and all down the front of, they have an oil of anointing to speak into this atmosphere. Bishop Pearson, Bishop elect Vanessa have found ways to get that oil distributed. And now what is happening with Bishop Pearson coming up the distribution of the oil will be even greater than what we are able to do now. Anticipate it. It is a move of God. It is a reformation of the spirit. It will explain in so many ways why, how, who, and what our next assignment. We did not die in the COVID, beloved. But we lived for a reason. There is a purpose. Good people died. Sound-minded people Loving people, kind people, dear people have died in the COVID because their assignment is finished. Ours is not. And I pray that what God will do is open up the door and make the way plain so that we can do what we were put in the earth realm and left in the earth realm to do. My heart is very, very deeply touched by the presence of this man and woman of God and all of those of you who are listening to us tonight. Let's be the change we want to see in the earth. God bless you. Thank you, Bishop Funda and Professor Anthea Buck. I, I just want to thank all of you tonight, Bishop Alec Brown, Bishop Flunda, Bishop Carlton Tearson. I, I really have been blessed by all of this, first of all. And I think I'm just going to be very simple about what I need to say. I think my book says everything I needed to say. Right. But I think the other thing that I need to say is you all need to get ready, because if you think one six was something, they're going to try again. And, and I'm here to warn you that this is important and you need to keep your eyes open. You need to be ready. You need to come up out of these places that are not feeding you and not feeding your people. You need to get your mind right and your game tight. Because it's not just about fighting for democracy or fighting for America, but it's about your soul. And it's about how you're going to live out the rest of this time on this earth 
and what you need to do. And if you spend your time wasting your time on these people who have wasted your time and took your money and didn't give you anything in return, then you need to call that to account and you need to go ahead on and try to figure out who it is you really do serve. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Thank you, Bishop Flunder and Bishop Pearson. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you to our social media platforms tonight for being here. We want to give you a few more announcements. Wait with us for a minute. Bishop Flunder. God bless you tonight. All of our beloved who are part of this conversation, please, please, please share this with your friends. This is an important and extremely important gathering as the many that have preceded it have been. I want to encourage you to support. I want to encourage you to support Beyond the Gatekeepers. And I'm encouraging you to support financially via Cash App to dollar sign TFAM Annual or to PayPal at www.paypal.me forward slash TFAM Justice, T F A M J U S T I C E. I believe that we should also support what supports us. Do what you can, do the best you can, and let's keep growing and let's keep speaking truth to power and making change in the time in which we live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Flunder. We appreciate your support, those of you that are watching. Our next ever. Hello everyone, this is Jess Dominic, owner of Bullet and Flight Radio, your story, our station, a proud supporter of progressive Christians from around the world. So please join us every Saturday and Sunday from 2 p.m. until 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the best in Gospel House, Gospel Indie, and Inspirational Word. And if you're looking to submit your music or sermons, please send us an MP3 and artist pick to bulletinflightpros at gmail.com. All submissions are free. Thank you for tuning in and God bless. Thank you so much, Bullet in Flight Radio. Awesome. Again, purchase Dr. Anthea Butler's book, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Go to amazon.com and bookshop.org to make your purchase today. As she said, I'm going to say it again. It is a quick read. It is, uh, you know, it's not that many chapters in this book, um, but it's powerful. First chapter is the racist foundations of evangelicalism in the 19th century. The second chapter is saving the nation, nation, fervor, fear, and the challenges to Jim Crow. The third chapter is whitewashing racism and the rise of the religious right. And the fourth chapter is how firm a foundation a 21st century precipice appears. And then we have a conclusion. Whom will you serve? Get the book. God bless you. We also have the Healing Place Apothecary, which is owned and operated by Nubian Flunder. She is the daughter of our presiding bishop. You can go to her website and make a purchase. You can go to www.thpapothecary.com. That's www thpapothecary.com. Sky Michelle teas and things. Go to www.skymichelle.com. Sky Michelle is the kid boss. You can follow her on her Facebook page and her IG page at I am Sky Michelle. She has customized uh, t-shirts that she makes. So if you have your own business, you have your own books, whatever it is, she can do it. She also has a collection of t-shirts that you can purchase on that website. Dope Black Pastor, Dope Black Preacher, all of those things. Faith Collection, the Y.E. Flunder Collection, which has uh, Bishop Flunder quotes and the Cara Motivation uh, section, which has Cara Motivational quotes. Please support this young entrepreneur. 
And then we have Kara Solutions. Focus on your passion. Let Kara handle the rest. This business is owned and operated by Susan A. Webley. She is the founder. She does remote production, video conferencing, admin, and tech support. She also does custom branding, promoting your graphics, overlays, intros, outros, video presentations, show development, planning, engagement, training on Zoom, streamer, restream. And if you want a consultation, it's free. You just have to email her at sue at kara-solutions.com. That's sue at kara-solutions.com. If you want to advertise with Beyond the Gatekeepers, please, every week, we would appreciate that. Advertise with us. Just go to uh, email us at beyondthegatekeepersshow at gmail.com. That's beyondthegatekeepersshow at gmail.com. Listen, thank you for joining us this week. We appreciate your support, your donations, your tuning in, you sharing. It has been a great help to us. Again, thank you for joining us and prayerfully we will see you next week. Thank you and God bless you.